to treat the malady. Of course, it was a 100% death rate. But that's what he would stick in the head of a baby at birth. And so these are things that are so horrific that you, you, you can't possibly wrap your head around it. And this man is, I mean, just Google him. And you think to myself, I think to myself, if I were up here in front of you right now, and this is going to become very important as you move, I move into the other slides. Um, if I stomped a puppy to death out here, up here, just a little puppy, and stomped it right here to death in front of you, most of you would need therapy. And I would be arrested probably faster than killing a black man for killing a puppy. How could you do that? Do you realize how much dissonance you have to remove in order to stick that into the brain of a child? More importantly, the child can no longer be human. Are you understanding what I'm saying? The reason why he could do it is they weren't human. They didn't even feel pain. That's what this man believed. Now, you may look at that and go, those are horrific things from the past. There is a book out right now, not table reading. It's called Medical Apartheid. This is written by Harriet Washington, it came out last year. This book chronicles the experimentation on black people up to contemporary day. See, we want to look at the Tuskegee experiments. We want to look at Sims and go, oh, that just still going on. Implicated, Harvard, John Hopkins, because we weren't what? Human. So that dehumanization is something that we really got to appreciate uh, went on for a long time. Can you go back? Back one more. No white could ever rape a slave woman. The regulations of law as to the white race on the subject of sexual intercourse do not and cannot for obvious reasons apply to slaves. Their intercourse is promiscuous. We've now justified raping black women because they can't be raped. They, we aren't raping them. They're promiscuous by nature. So we can't do it. Uh, forward, one more. The fact that white men could profit from raping their female slaves does not mean that their motive was economic. The rape of slave women by their masters was primarily a weapon of terror that reinforced whites' domination over their human property. Rape was an act of physical violence designed to stifle black women's will to resist and to remind them of their servile status. These become important instruments that you look at. And I want to give you some statistics as it relates to American history. By the mid-1800s, there was over 600,000 mixed-race children born, 600,000. How many of you know what um, miscegenation is? Miscegenation is the illegal marriage between people of different races. Actually, it was very profound here. That was illegal to marry someone of another race. So when you consider the fact that one of the greatest issues and one of the number one reasons why black men were lynched, beaten, and imprisoned had to do with the fear that they were going to rape whom? White women. Now the numbers, I mean, we're talking about pure numbers, numbers alone. It was who being raped? OK, it was, it was black women being raped. But they can be raped. Let's advance forward. Before we get into um, the Casual Killing Act, the Casual Killing Act was written uh, because of the number of people who were killed by, while being corrected. Okay. And if any slave resists his master, owner, or other person by his or her order, correcting such slave and shall happen to be killed in such correction, it shall not be counted felony, but the master, owner, and every other person so giving correction shall be acquitted of all punishment and accusation for the same as if such accident had never happened. So that means that if you happen to be correcting someone and you beat them to death, you know how hard it is to beat someone to death? I mean, you know, I thought about that. I said, it happened so frequently that they created a law so that you wouldn't feel any what? No guilt, because you were simply correcting them. It wasn't your fault. So I went back to look at who was beating folks to death. I wanted to know. And it was white women. White women were beating black children to death. That's who was being beaten to death. But she, it wasn't her fault. She was just correcting them. 
You see, what we do is we rob ourselves of our own humanity when we refuse to look at this stuff. We rob ourselves of our humanity. And that's what people didn't know happened. Going forward, one more. Then you had the mental health folks. This is how we got in. We got in to try to fix it. In the early years of the 19th century, a physician named Samuel A. Cartwright argued that two particular forms of mental illness caused by nerve disorders were prevalent among slaves. One was drapedomania, which was diagnosable by a single symptom, the uncontrollable urge to escape from slavery. So now what we've done is we've now pathologized your desire to be free. Must be something wrong with them. Keep, keep trying to free themselves. And again, it would be funny if it weren't in journals. You see, all of this is to remove the cognitive dissonance. Now we have, look at all the people joining in. You got Linnaeus, you got anthropology, you got physicians. All of them saying, they deserve it. It's not us. We don't need to adjust anything. And if they just tried harder, how about you people just pull yourselves up from your bootstraps? What's the matter with you? The playing field has been leveled. Well, we're going to see if, in fact, it's been leveled. Or is that conjecture? Move forward. Now, I want you to look at this photo very closely, and I want you to see who's in it. More important than the man hanging, because you've got to understand the lynchings that occurred in America happened after slavery, not during. Thousands of lynchings happened after slavery because this is a reaction to white fear of what we would do once freed. But we didn't create a vigilante group to take out white people, but they did create a vigilante group to take us out now that we're free. See, that happened after slavery. They were called the what? The Ku Klux Klan. They don't wear hoods anymore. They wear suits. But they're alive and well all over the world, even here. So. Look at who's in the picture. I want you to look at this little girl in particular. You can't see her closely, but she's actually grimacing, like smirking. Now, remember, let's go back to the puppy concept here. She would be loathed and torn up probably if this was a puppy, which means he's less than that, because she's not disturbed. This little girl is not, is not disturbed by this, but she should be, shouldn't she? People always ask me, they go, Joy, what was the impact on white people? There it is. Right there. Can't feel any empathy for him. None, zero, zip. There's a little one back here, even smaller. Because whatever she's been taught or told, socialized to believe, makes him no longer human. That's the greatest danger to white people, is that they can't feel it. And there's a reason why white people can't feel what we're talking about. My God, what would you then feel? It's tough. So I've got to believe, oh, it's all over now. It's not my fault. I don't benefit. It's not a big deal. Let's move on. It's not all of those things. But we don't say that to Jewish people. I dare you. But you have to understand, when you unearth this one, that's what we did to our children. Let's move forward. This is a similar photo to the one that uh, is used in um, Denzel's movie. Now, and again, most important, this is a man that's being burned. Also, I won't read the depiction, but there are newspaper accounts of this. It's written in a book called 100 Years of Lynching by Ginsburg. No pictures, just newspapers that say not only did they burn him, they decapitated him, cut him into pieces, and used parts of his body as things to put on mantles. So people would say, get me a tongue, would you, or a liver, a little crisp, so I could put it on the mantle. Now, again, I want you to look at the folks. I want you to look at who's here. We're not talking about the toothless, big gut, hooded wonder. Are we? We're looking at plain old, common, dressed up folks. They're squeezing, please, I want my picture taken. Are you following me? 
This is somebody's cousin, uncle, somebody. And the ability to do that dehumanized this man and robbed them of their humanity all at the same time. All at the same time. That is the most dangerous, treacherous thing that could happen. What did Hitler do? He dehumanized human beings, put babies in ovens. Anything that robs us of our humanity is a danger to everyone. And that is what's going on with people of African descent all over the world because not only did it get done here, but who did we tell the entire world we told these people don't deserve any value? Everyone wants to be American, not y'all. But when we go, I mean, I literally go to countries all over the world. America sets the standard. And thank God for what happened later. Let's move forward. So a lot of people start saying, well, y'all got free, right? Y'all are free. Everything is fine. Because <laughs> I see, that, see, whenever you talk about post-Max slave syndrome, people get locked there. So there's a myth that after slavery ended, the playing field was leveled. Was it? Remember, all the lynchings occurred after slavery. That wasn't during, after slavery. So you had black sharecropping. Now, we didn't get a lot of black history in our schooling. I have four degrees, and three of them advanced degrees. Never did I get black history. I got about two pages of black history, and one of them, what page was a picture? And there was a picture of the little folks with the cabin. You probably saw the same picture. It's a little cabin. The little guy on the porch with the banjo. Little children running, frolicking about, eating watermelon. Right? Everybody happy? And we certainly need little Mary and little, little Johnny to believe that they were, they were happy. <laughs> the slaves were happy people. And they had a nice place to live. Because we couldn't have them feeling cognitive what? Not little Mary. She can't start questioning what Grandpa did. So I want you to see this because those are leftover slave quarters. He's a sharecropper. So now let's go back and take a look at sharecropping. Now these are folks that were slaves, no longer slaves, decided I'm going back to be a sharecropper on the same plantation that I was a slave. Why would you do that? Let's move forward. Here's why. Because when you did try to leave, and you go north, because you're free. I want you to go north now. I live in Oregon, right? That's where I live. Here we go. No free Negro mulatto not residing in this state at the time of the adoption of this Constitution shall come reside or be within this state or hold any real, real estate or make any contracts or maintain any suit therein. And the legislative assembly shall provide by penal laws for the removal by public officers of all such Negroes and mulattoes and for their effectual exclusion from the state, and for the punishment of persons who shall bring them into the state or employer, harbor them. This was repealed November 3rd, 1926. My father was alive. Section 6, that if any free Negro mulatto shall fail to quit the country as required by this act, if guilty upon trial, shall receive upon his or her back not less than 20, no more than 39. We'll beat you. That if any free Negro Malala shall fail to quit the country within the term of six months after receiving such stripes, he or she shall again receive the same punishment over ev once every six months until he or she shall quit the country. We're going to beat you until you leave. But you are free. The playing field is leveled. Pull yourself up from your bootstraps. Are you following me? So he went back to the plantation. Let's go back. He went back to the plantation to be a sharecropper because that's the only place he could live. But he can't read or write because it was illegal to educate a slave. So I'm illiterate. I go back and I say to the slave owner, who past slave owner, OK, now I'm coming back to work for a fair wage because I'm free. And the slave owner says, sure, you can come back. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to advance you seed, tool, and a mule. In other words, you know, I am going to um, give you that grant <laughs> that you want. And we're going to let you work with that. And at the end of the year, we'll settle up. Well, the grant's never enough, is it? And so at the end of the year, he's found owing. 
Now, what must he do to pay off that debt? He's got to work it off, yes. And his children have to work it off, yes. That's called debt servitude or another form of slavery. But you all are free. What are you whining about? Let's move forward. Move forward. So, well, can we lease them? Now, you, everybody wants to know big issue. You have overrepresentation here. Guess how I know. Overrepresentation in the criminal justice system as its ideology. It was big business then. It's big business now. You're going to get free labor one way or another. New slavery is imprisonment. Well, let's see. Why was this? It was so successful by the mid-1898, nearly three-quarters of Alabama's total state revenue came directly from this institution. Well, of course, I wanted to do research on what they did, because they're free. But now we're arresting them at alarming rates. And for what? 12 years for vagrancy, loitering, startling a white woman, looking menacingly at a white woman. That's what they got 10, 12, 15 years for. And many of them, 25% died under convict lease more than during slavery because there were no protections because now we have another label to justify our behavior towards them. And what's their new label? Well, after all, they're convicts. They're criminals. Don't they deserve it? Do you see what I'm saying? So when did it end is the question. Move forward. You all heard about Katrina, yes? Yeah. See, I was there. <laughs> My family's from Louisiana. I went to the Ninth Ward. Sometimes you can't pay attention to what the news says. It's important to actually go eyeball what's going on, which was very interesting, because it was one of the most horrific events I'd ever seen and probably will ever see in my life. Well, black folks were just simply treated differently. Did you notice that? Here's the good news about Katrina. Everybody noticed it. So all the rest of the world where we learn, send us your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, your democracy, your equality. They said, what happened with that Katrina thing? All that stuff y'all talked about. Well, let me read this. This is from Associated Press, taken straight from the newspaper. In the front, actually, the top part here is actually a woman, but they think it's a man. Anyway, it says, a young man walks through chest-deep flood water after looting a grocery store in New Orleans on Tuesday, August 30th, 2005. Same body of water down here, excuse me. Two residents wade through chest deep water after finding bread and soda from a local grocery store. Now, same event, same water. White people, black people. We've told you what you see now. That removes your what? Dissonance, because these people can't be perceived as looting. They're white people. White people don't loot. Now, the truth of the matter is, I don't care what any of them are doing. It doesn't matter, but I'm going to still the social conscience by letting you know, don't forget, this is a looter. Matter of fact, what you last heard was that they were looters and rapists. Did you not? So don't they deserve it? That wasn't back in, oh, I don't know, slavery, though, was it? Now we're going to kind of move into operationalizing that to look at what is it, how does it, how do we begin to uh, connect that, that behavior, those, that history to what we're dealing with and what you're dealing with right now and what we're seeing. And very often people say, well, is everything post-traumatic slave syndrome? Obviously that, that would, you know, trivialize all the work. You know, we cannot lay squarely on the shoulders of post-traumatic, all the problems that we see, we see nor can we uh, place all the problems squarely on the shoulders of white people or any of the above. So hopefully we won't um, digress into anything that is that foolish in terms of a discussion. Because, you know, it, that's another thing that happens in terms of trying to, to deal with the pushback around this. Uh, then we move into extremes and it tends to dilute the realities that are going on. So um, uh, hopefully we're way beyond all that. Well, now she's saying everything is post-traumatic. No, I'm not. Um, and most of my work, uh, my background is really in the field, doing, um, you know, doing work in the community and grassroots. That's where my, my training was in terms of my clinical work 
and just, you know, the fact that I've always been, uh, this work started on the ground. It didn't start here. Matter of fact, the attention, I got the attention of places like Oxford and Harvard and, you know, the um, Ivy League and major institutions, even, even the, uh, the FBI, you know, but those were things that happened after um, I did, started doing the work on the grassroots level. Um, and so it's, for me, my, my commitment is to healing. So this is not an, an exercise uh, in some kind of broad intellectual esoteric. It's really about how do we then take this information and help a person extricate themselves from uh, behavior that they've learned and or been socialized to believe black and white and everyone in, in the middle that's been affected by this. Um, what do we do? So this is kind of looking at the contemporary uh, kind of reflection of the trauma uh, which is white, white supremacy and terrorism, that continues. We, we see that on a daily basis in the United States as well as, as here. Uh, this book is called um, Breaking Rank by Norm Stamper. Norm Stamper is a 34-year police veteran. He was a chief of police for the cities of San Diego and Seattle. This is a white man wrote this book called Breaking Rank, and he really did. So all I can tell you is he broke rank. I've been trying to meet Norm. Norm travels quite a bit, and he gets a considerable uh, amount of uh, death threats because of what he's done. But he talked about, and this is contemporary. And remember, that's what we're looking at. How does it reflect itself today? I've heard some police officers refer to prostitute slayings or to the slayings of blacks as misdemeanor murders, employing an unofficial code for them, NHI, which means no human involved. Now these are on telephone calls, these are on calls that you hear on police officers speaking, hey, what do you have? Well, we have a NHI, we have no human involved, it's a black person killed. You see what I'm saying? Again, the dehumanization reflecting itself in just their casual involvement with one another. San Diego cops confess to a myriad other acts of discrimination, including additionally dehumanizing the references to blacks on a radio call, just an 1113 nigger. 1113 is a code for an injured animal. How many people think they understand what racism is? Show of hands. Come on, you know, you, 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 you think you know. I'm not suggesting I know. I just have a couple of definitions that, uh, that kind of came to me as I thought about it. How many people think there are white racists? That there are white racists out there? How many think there are black racists out there? Okay. Now, this is an interesting thing, because this becomes important as we begin to define concepts. Now, I do that, I usually define concepts um, all, the, all the way. But one of the things that I, I do is I try to help people get a picture of what I mean by, by racism. So tell me how it is. I'm going to first category is white racism, then we'll deal with black racism. So white racism. Tell me the ways in which white racism adversely impacts the lives of black people. Just what are the ways that white racism can adversely impact the lives of black people as a group? What are some of those ways? I'm sorry? Power, but how is that defined specifically? Education, okay. I'm sorry? Economically employment, what else? Housing, what else? Policing, why are we here today? Healthcare, okay. Now, we could actually kind of grow that list. Now we're going to move over to black racism. Tell me the ways in which black racism adversely impacts the lives of white people as an entire group. Thank you. The reason why you become silent is one that always comes up, and that's fear. White people are afraid of black people. They are afraid of us. And it's a very interesting thing because black people know it. We know white people are afraid. But you have to start getting into the psychology. What are you afraid of? Why are you afraid? But it's an interesting dynamic. Now, also you see the difference in what racism is, do you not? Racism implies you have not just prejudice, but the power to do something with that prejudice. Now, I don't like you, not only that, but I'm going to control whether you can get, you know, I may say I hate you. I hate white people. I hate them. I hate them. It's not going to change you getting that, you know, loan <laughs> when you go to the bank. You could go, you can hate, I can hate you all the way to the bank. 
not gonna change. Do you see the difference? That whereas white racism says, not only do I not like you, but I'm gonna change the, the impact of where you can live. I'm going to determine with that racism where, where your powers are, you following me? And I'm talking about as a group, not an individual, because people said, I remember when my uncle didn't, I'm not talking about your uncle. I'm talking about the whole group. I'm not talking about an incident. That's a difference. But white people are afraid. So let's get into how this fear impacts criminal justice. Because if white people in this room are afraid of black people, guess who else is afraid of black people? Only they have guns. 